here's our second half of chapter 10. We're going to talk about network connectivity and email. When we look at wireless data networks, mobile devices give people the freedom to work, learn, play, and communicate wherever they want. People using mobile devices do not need to be tied to a physical location to send or receive voice, video, and data communication. Many college campuses use wireless networks to allow students to sign up for classes, watch lectures, and submit assignments in areas where physical connections to the network are unavailable. With mobile devices more and more powerful, there are many tasks that need to be performed on large computers connected to physical networks that can now be completed using a mobile device on a wireless network. Connection to an internet through a cellular company is expensive and relies on cellular towers and satellites to create a mesh, mesh of global coverage. Typically, cellular companies charge their customers based on the amount of data they transport through the cellular network. A cellular connection can become very expensive. There are many places that go through and have um, connection to the internet. These connections are usually based on established cable, TV, or telephone lines. Companies providing this type of connection to the internet usually charge a flat fee for a specific speed, regardless of the amount of data. The relatively low cost cost of this type of connection makes it possible for businesses to provide free internet connections for their customers. Almost all mobile devices are capable of connecting to the Wi-Fi networks. It's advisable to connect to Wi-Fi networks when possible because the data used over Wi-Fi does not count against your cellular plan data. Also because Wi-Fi radios use less power than cellular radios, connecting to a Wi-Fi network conserves your battery power. Like other Wi-Fi enabled devices, it's important to use security when connecting to Wi-Fi networks. These precautions should be taken to protect Wi-Fi communications. Use the highest Wi-Fi security framework. Enable security on home networks. Never send login or log password information using clear unencrypted text and use a VPN connection when possible. We've talked about tethering and this is um, when you can synchronize data, share files or connect the internet between two devices or a cable. When people began to use cell phones, there were few industry-wide standards for cell phone technology. Without standards, it was difficult or expensive to make calls to people who were on another network. Today, most cell phone providers use an industry standard, making it less expensive to use cell phones to make calls. Standards have not been adopted uniformly around the world. Some phones are capable of using multiple standards where others can only use one standard. As a result, some cell phones can operate in many countries and other cell phones can only be used locally. The first generation 1G of cell phones began service in the 80s. They were primarily used for analog devices. Interfer with analog, interference and noise cannot be easily separated from the voice and the signal. This factor limits the usefulness of analog systems. Few 1G devices are still used today. In the 90s, second generation or 2G devices was marked by a switch from analog to digital. Digital standards provide a higher cell quality. 3G standards were being developed in extensions to the 2G standards. These transitions were known as 2.5G standards. 3G standards enable mobile devices to go beyond simple voice and data. It's now common for mobile devices to send and receive text, photos, and audio and video. 3G even provides enough bandwidth for video conferencing. 3G mobile devices are able to access the internet to browse, play games, and listen to music, and to watch videos. 4G standards provide ultra-band broadband internet access, higher data rates, and users download files much faster. You have mobile WinMax and you have long-term evolution, LTE. These specific requirements for 4G devices set peak speed requirements at 100 megabytes for highly mobile devices and 1 gigabytes for devices still being used by people moving slowly or standing still. We've talked about hotspots and, and airplane modes, which is also going through an increasing functionality depending on how you're using your device. Bluetooth for mobile devices, um, cellular and Wi-Fi can be difficult to configure and require extra equipment, such as tower and access points. Cable connections are not always practical, practical when connecting headsets or speakers, so Bluetooth technology provides a simple way for mobile devices to connect to each other. Here are some examples of how mobile devices use Bluetooth, hand-free headset, keyboard or mouse, stereo, car speaker, tethering, and mobile speakers. Bluetooth pairing is when Bluetooth devices establish connection between shared resources. In order for the device to pair, the Bluetooth radios must be turned on and one device must search for the other. 
Other devices must be set to discoverable. That they way they can be detected. When a Bluetooth device is in discoverable mode, it transmits the following information. Name, Bluetooth class, technical information such as the features, and during the process, a PIN may be required to authenticate. The PIN is often a number, but it also can be a numeric code or passkey. Email structures rely on servers and clients. Email servers are responsible for forwarding email messages sent by the users. The following information is required to set up an email account. Your display name, which can be your real name, nickname, or any other device. Your email address, which also needs to include the at symbol and the domain of your email server. Email protocols used by the incoming mail server, incoming and outgoing mail server names, username, and password. The protocols used in email include the following. POP3, IMAP, SMTP, MIME, SSL. You need to know how to configure a device to accept the correct incoming mail format. You can also configure the, mail my, the email client using a wizard. POP3 stands for Post Office Protocol 3. Retrieves email from the remote server over TCP IP. POP3 does not leave a copy of the email on the server. However, some impl implementations allow the user to specify the mail to be saved for some period of time. POP3 supports end users that have intermittent connections such as a dial-up. POP3 users can connect, download email from the server, and disconnect. POP3 usually uses port 110. IMAP, which is Internet Mail Access Protocol, allows a local email client to retrieve email from a server. Like POP3, IMAP allows you to download email from an email server using an email client. The difference is IMAP allows the user to organize email on the network email server and download copies of an email. The original email remains on the network email server. Unlike POP3, IMAP typically leaves the original email on the server until you move the email to a personal folder on your email application. The most recent version of IMAP is IMAP 4, and it's used on large networks such as university campuses. IMAP usually uses port 143. SMTP is a simple mail transfer protocol. It's a text-based protocol that transmits email across TCP IP networks. This is an email format used for text that only uses ASIC coding. SMTP must be implemented to send email. It is usually used as port 25. Multipurpose Internet Mail Extension, MIME, extends the email format to include ASEC standard as well as other formats such as pictures, words, and process documents. MEME is normally used in conjunction with SMTP. SSL, Secure Socket Layer, was developed to transmit file security. The data exchange between the email and the client and the email server is encrypted. When configuring an email client to use SSL, make sure to use the correct port number for their email server. Exchange is an email server contact manager and calendaring software used by Microsoft. Exchange uses proprietary measuring architecture called Messaging Application Programming Interface, or MAPI. Android email conf configuration is using advanced communication and data services. Many of these applications features require the use of a web service provided by Google. When you configure an Android mobile device for the first time, you are prompted to sign in with your Google account to get your Gmail address and password. By signing into your Google account, the Google Play Store data and, and sets up your background. If you do not have a Gmail account, you can use the Google account to sign in page to create one. iOS devices ship with a stock mail app, which can be handled multiple email accounts simultaneously. The mail is also supporting a number of different email account types, including iCloud, Yahoo, Gmail, Outlook, and Exchange. The Apple ID is required to set up an iOS device, and Apple ID is used to access the App Store. Unlike local email, where the server is controlled by an in-house administrator, Internet email refers to an email service that's hosted somewhere on the Internet and controlled by a third party of team of administrators. As more people began to use email, there became to need a need for an email service for people with limited or no technical knowledge. Companies deploy, host, and manage their service, leaving the users a task of managing their personal messages. Mobile device manufacturers typically add email apps to their operating system, and these apps often allow for a number of different internet email services to be configured. These are some of the common options for accessing internet web accounts. Web interface, GUI desktop email clients such as Mail, Outlook, Windows Live, and Thunderbird, 
mobile email app clients such as Gmail and Yahoo, and stock OS mobile email apps such as iOS Mail. Many people use a combination of desktop, laptop, and tablet smartphone devices for accessing and storing information. This specific information is accessed from multiple devices, so scheduling an appointment from a calendar would look different when you're going there, so we have data synchronization. Some of the most common types of data that can be synchronized is contact, email, calendar, pictures, message, apps, video, browser links, and location data. Section 10-4 is using Linux and OS X operating systems. Unix is a non propriety operating system based on the C programming language and user commands interface. Some popular desktop operating systems based on Unix such as Linux, OS X, Android, and iOS. Linux operating systems are used practically every platform, including embedded systems, wearable devices, smartwatches, cell phones, netbooks, netbooks, PC servers, and supercomputers. Although Linux is getting a larger user base, Android, a modified version of Lindex, is being responsible for operating systems spread through most of the consumer market. OS X, formerly known as Max OS X, is an operating system for Macintosh computers. It is for formerly known as your Mac OS X. It's streamlined for Macintosh computer hardware and can be seamless, work seamlessly with other Apple devices such as iPhones. Most operating systems include one or more GUI component facilitation, the use of computer interaction. Linux GU GUI, a different Linux distribution ships with different software packages, but users decide what stays in their system by installing or removing packages. The graphical interface in a Linux is comprised of a number of subsystems that will also be removed or replaced by the user. While the details of these subsystems and their interactions are beyond the scope of this course, it's important to know that Linux GUI as a whole can be easily replaced by a user. As a result of the extremely large number of Linux distributions, this chapter focuses on Ubuntu when covering Linux. Ubuntu Linux uses Unity as its default GUI. Ubuntu Unity Desktop. Another feature of the Linux GUI is the ability to have multiple desktops or workplaces. The process of backing up and of data refers to creating a copy or multiple copies of data for safekeeping. When backing up the process is complete, a copy is called a backup, the primary goal of its ability to restore and recover the data in case of failure. Gaining access to an earlier version of the data is often seen as a secondary goal of replying or making a backup. For Linux, several backup tools and solutions are available. Linux Deja Dupe is easy and efficient for backing up our data. Deja Dupe supports a number of features including local, remote, and cloud backups, data encryption, compromising, com excuse me, compression, incremental backups, and periodic scheduled backups and GNOME desktop integration. It also features from any particular backup. Computer systems are always going to need periodic preventative computer maintenance to ensure best performance. Maintenance tasks should be scheduled and performed frequently to prevent problems to detect problems early. To avoid missing maintenance tasks due to human error, a computer system can be programmed to perform tasks automatically. Two tasks that be, should be scheduled and performed are automatically are backup and disk, chess. disk checks. Scheduling backups are important to make sure that important data is not lost due to hardware failure. The more frequent the backup, the smaller the risk of data loss. Magnetic-based media ability to hold electronic magnetic charges for storing data wears out with time. By periodically checking the disk for bad sectors, an administrator can become aware of potential for failure, allowing for planned and data migration. A number of command line tools are included in, in Unix type systems by default. To adjust the command line tool operations, users can enter parameters and switches along with the command. It's easy to create and edit text files with the command line interface, or CLI. The command VI opens a text editor. The command Q is used to edit the editor when you are finished. In order to organize the system and reinforce boundaries within the system, Unix utilizes file permissions. 
file permissions are built into the file system structure and provided a mechanism to def define permissions to every file. Every file in a Unix system carries its file permissions, which defines the actions that owner, the group, and others can do with the file. Section 10-5 is basic troubleshooting process for mobile Linux and um, OS X operating systems. So we have to go through and take a look at what is our problem, what's your theory of probable cause, test the theory, and establish a plan. I hope these sound familiar because we've talked about these in a couple chapters. Don't forget to verify that you have full system functionality and implement preventative maintenance. And as always, don't forget to document your findings, actions, and your outcomes. How can you identify your common problems? You want to make sure you take a look at issues at, um, attributed to hardware, software, and network, or a combination of these three. When a reboot does not fix a PC, oftentimes more investigations should be come. Some configuration can be changed and the software updates are going to be required, so a misbehaving program can be the culprit and must be reinstalled. Here is Chapter 10. I hope you learned some things about mobile devices.